Hi, and welcome back to Celebrate Pipes. And we're just going to continue on with my good friend Patrick Martin about reeds. Reeds are what happens, the magic that happens inside in the pipes and the different parts. And Patrick is a fine reed maker and he actually made some of the reeds that are in my pipes. So um, he's going to explain the process to you. That's right. Um, so the reason uh, the, the reeds are what basically generates the sound and makes a sound. I'll show you a reed here. I have a, have a few with me in the box. These are the little reeds. They're, they're made from cane and I don't want to be too boring and technical, but cane grows and it, it's classed as a grass, you know, like grass, mm -hmm. um, bamboos and yeah. stuff. It, it's a grass rather than a wood, supposedly. The, piper often or as the pipe maker just fa fashions the reeds out of the cane the mm -hmm. raw cane this is this is the raw cane it's kind of uh, hollow tubes and you you basically just split it you shape it you carve it follow follow these patterns and templates to to get the finished reed and it it goes inside the chanter and the various Various other pipes contain reeds as well, as you know, for the drones, yeah. all the other parts. The reed itself <laughs> makes that crow. We call it a crow, oh, yeah. for want of a better word. It's, yep. it's making, a, making a sound. That's all it does. It, make, it makes that crow. It's not till it goes into the, into the pipe that has holes and, a, like... A shape inside yeah. and hold that you create the music, I suppose. Just to ask you there when I saw you put it in your mouth, is it you like the difference between this reed and say a oboe reed or a clarinet reed? It's the same same idea, isn't the, it? Same idea. Yeah. Um, but but you can't buy an oboe or you a can't. bassoon or a saxophone reed to work in, in yeah. pipes or vice versa. It, yeah. it's, it's very it's very precise. Mm -hmm. It's um like and you couldn't even, blow that even with your mouth. different sets of pipes, they won't take the same reeds. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's something to be aware of if you take up pipes. Um, yeah. You have to at least understand what they are, yeah. if not how to make them. Yeah, <laughs> have patience as well. And yeah. to in a full set of pipes then, how many reeds like that so, are there? Yeah, there's seven. There's seven. seven. And then in the drones, is it the same type of reed or is it a different type? Slightly more, thank God, slightly more simple type okay, of reed okay. goes in there. I, I've got a, got a few. You're, you're using much smaller okay. sticks of, of cane for, okay. the, for the drone reeds. And it, it only takes a couple of minutes to make a, a nice little drone reed for yourself with yeah. a, a little, um, little craft knife and stuff like that. You can, it comes, in, it comes in slightly different varying thicknesses but yeah. depending on what you need yeah you, you just kind of make a little split okay tongue tongue and it vibrates and makes makes a sound for your drones Brilliant. Yeah. Lovely sound it is yeah and you're a fine reed maker as well uh, because so. patrick has made a few of the reeds that are in my pipes and i'm just going to talk about a few shall we say pipe makers and pipe players that are local to loud mm -hmm. and shall we say the greater not an Oriel region, but you know, a little bit further north then as well. In Drogheda, famously, were the Taylor brothers, and William and Charles Taylor, and they both came, it would have been in the 19th century, they would have been in Drogheda, but their father was also a pipe maker and an organ maker, because as you can see, there's a lot of technical things going on here as well, and if you see an organ, the size of an organ and all the different parts and that, a lot of that knowledge would have been taken and then transferred onto the pipes. Um, but not only uh, did they work here, then the two sons started doing pipe making, but they also, as what happened in a lot of the latter part of the 19th century, a lot of Irish people went to America, they emigrated to America, they would have went to New York, Boston, New Jersey and Philadelphia. Right. And they, a, lot, a lot of them played, played professionally. Played professionally played. Yeah. Like had that period of, of time where 
you know, you, you had professional Patsy Tui, Patsy Tui, yeah, as a yeah. famous example um, going, going around. Yeah, he did, and would have played like at um, carnivals and uh, different shows and different things Concert like that, halls. and dressed up in green. Um, but the Taylor brothers themselves, they would have went to New York first, set up what was called a would have been a wood turning shop, but would have been working on different types of woodwork, but also making pipes, and then they eventually moved then to Philadelphia. But this Taylor sets of pipes are really famous because um, to have a Taylor set of pipes would be like having a Stradivarius violin, like yeah, a Stradivarius so violin would be very... Um, collectible, I collectible suppose. Sought and after. Yeah. Sought after, beautiful looking as well. I've seen a couple in the Piper Club up in Dublin, and just the ornate design, not only are they functional, they look beautiful. Um, what, I, what I just read something about the Taylor Brothers mm. from Draha, that they, they innovated, they, they, uh, they developed the Yellen Pipe they did. somewhat. They did. I don't know exactly Tim's in what way, but they certainly refined aspects they did. and developed. The regulators, I think yeah. they helped with the regulators. I and think then they had their own way of making keys as well. That's right. Yeah. Very, quite distinctive. Yeah. And they would have used concert pitch. I think they could have been the first used concert pitch, yeah. which is a hell of an innovation. Um, then after that there's another great piper he was from Drogheda as well it was Pat Ward and he would have been taught by one of the Taylor brothers um, and he owned a set of Taylor pipes which is very sought after um, but he also used a double chanter now Patrick you're probably familiar with a double chanter and a double chanter is the same as what we were playing but imagine two reeds inside there because they would have been playing in dance halls and there was no amplification back then in America or Ireland for the sound so they used double reeds so you have double the sound and to keep two reeds in tune must have been a nightmare mm. but um, and the amount of air that would have taken as well to keep it going don't don't see them much now no, they're more don't. of a curiosity on yeah. museum piece almost yeah yeah I've never seen yeah. them to be honest I've never seen them but they're amazing. And he was one of the co founders of the Piper Club in Dublin. Um, mm -hmm. The old Piper Club in Dublin. But it was a great place. His home was a great place for people to come in and play tunes. And Pipers would have went to his place to get their reeds fixed or get their okay. pipes fixed or anything like yeah. that. He would have been influenced. He would have influenced Seamus Ennis, who's probably one of the most famous mm. Huge piper. Huge important figure in, in Irish piping. Oh, massive. Massive. But he was a... He was a personality as well and he was one that there's so much video of him because he was alive until the late 80s yeah he was a collector he worked he he started being able to remember tunes at the age of three his dad would have learned the pipes and played the pipes and he was able to hum tunes from the age of three which is incredible mm. and his dad make up I remember, just remember that what you have there, the little piece of wood, mm -hmm. his dad make up a mock set of pipes for him to play, oh. like with no reeds or anything like that, just so he could find where the holes right. were. But mm -hmm. um, he would have went on to work for the Irish Folklore Commission going around Ireland on a bicycle with a pen and a paper and collecting tunes. Mm -hmm. And plus he was well versed in Irish as well. Mm. So he could go off to the, the West, over to Connemara, down to the Kerry. And, but after that then, he started presenting on RT Radio 1. He was also a very in influential player of the pipes, oh, yes. you know, because he was just so accomplished. So accomplished. And he had these very, huge fingers. Very great piper wow. player, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he would have played at big festivals. If you think festivals like Electric Picnic now, but something back in the 80s equivalent, he was playing a gig on his own on the pipes to massive crowds. Mm. At the same time, the Dubliners would have played. Mm. Um, back in the 70s and 80s. But then he went over to BBC over in the UK in the 50s and he was involved with collecting tunes from Wales, Scotland, um, mm. out in the islands in Scotland and we he stayed over that. there. Yeah, Good yeah. Um, but just his legacy was incredible as well. And not only did he, you know, his gigs or his performances or anything like that, there would have been, he'd tell you about the tune, he'd write the tune, mm -hmm. um, down, but he'd also have the history of the tune and sometimes he'd sing the song before he'd played the tune in the pipes especially with slow airs and things like that, that. Yeah. but um yeah he was hugely yeah. influential 
Yes, and, and another very important Ellen Piper, of course, in the last century was Leo Rosum from a famous Rosum family of pipers and pipe makers from Dublin. Yeah. Um, we, all, we all know about him. Uh, Leo, Leo was a third generation Ellen Piper. Um, his grandfather made pipes. His father before him, William Rosum, made pipes. Young, young Leo learnt piping and pipe making from a young age also. He was, uh, he was a very prominent maker, you know, for his, he was very celebrated for the tone of his pipes mm. and the tuning. He formed a Piper's Club quartet. in Dublin. Oh, the Piper's the, Club as well. The, yeah. the Piper's Cork Quartet. They all the Dickey bows, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, he extensively performed on radio. Um, Great teacher too. Yeah, did, did a huge lot of teaching yeah. in, in the school in Dublin and elsewhere. He, 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 Leo, Leo formed Nepi Brielan along with Seamus Ennis, basically. In, That's right. Yeah. Was it 1967? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Nepibrilin. Yeah. Um, will I go on with a tune? Sure. Am I allowed? Yeah, you. Um, let me see. I was going to play two jigs, and the first one is called "Ask Your Father." And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Pat Ward would have played this tune, and then after that, I'll play a tune called "Pat Ward's Jig." which would have been played by Seamus Ennis and his father, James Ennis. So um, that's the link there. So there are two jigs. Um, yeah, that's it. Let's see. 